I'm 45 years old. My wife Glenda is one year younger. We have been married for 25 years. So, earlier this year, we marked our silver anniversary. We had a great time on our week-long trip to the Western Caribbean. Alan, our son, has just turned 25. He earned a degree in electrical engineering and married his wonderful wife, Brenda, who is a joy to be around. Our daughter, Elise, is a year younger than Alan. She studied music and education and now works as the assistant choral director at our local high school, a job she enjoys. She recently married Edward, and they are really happy together. We don't have any grandchildren yet, but we're enjoying our time alone without rushing them. Glenda and I have had a wonderful marriage. We've always helped each other and looked after each other's needs. Our love life has slowed down slightly, but we've both been content with it. She frequently played Colby Kailat's song, Bubbly, which she said mirrored her feelings for me. She understood how to make me feel appreciated. We frequently get out with our friends Bob and Teresa. I've known Bob since junior high, and we've been close friends ever since. Glenda and I are godparents to their three grown children, and our children have always addressed them as Uncle Bob and Aunt Teresa. Our families are quite close, and we have spent many vacations together. Glenda is the most attractive woman in the world to me, with Teresa coming in a close second. However, we have always observed boundaries. We've danced with each other's husbands, but never crossed any boundaries. I'd do everything for Bob and Teresa, just as I would for Glenda. Our life seemed ideal until Glenda began to feel ill. She saw the doctor and was promptly referred to an oncologist. We learned out she had stage 4 pancreatic cancer, which is incurable. The doctor estimated she had around six months left, with the first four being relatively good quality. To manage her suffering throughout the previous two months, she would most certainly need palliative care. We were surprised and informed our loved ones. Alan and Elise, along with their spouses, returned home to support us. They wanted to stay, but Glenda did not want to ruin their lives. Bob and Teresa were also upset, but their support meant so much to us. Glenda wanted them to look after me once she was gone and encouraged me to date again later. I was not ready to talk about it, so I remained mute. I wanted to be the greatest husband I could be to her till the very end. Glenda didn't want to spend time feeling sorry for herself. I suggested she resign her job, but she insisted on retaining it for consistency. Interestingly, her desire for closeness grew, and she wanted to explore new things. Despite her condition, she became more daring in our sex life, and we had many memorable experiences together. When we weren't at home, we went out with Bob and Teresa, making the most of each moment. Hank, have you been enjoying our sex life recently? Yeah, darling. It seems like you're trying to exhaust me, but I'm not complaining. Every moment with you is unique and memorable. That's what I'm attempting to accomplish. Honey, I won't be here much longer, and I want to make enough great memories to last you a lifetime. Glenda, we've been having so much fun recently, and I don't want to waste a single moment by doing nothing. I knew you felt that way, Hank. I am ready for anything, whenever you want to do it. I'm delighted you said that because I want to speak with you about something essential. Sure, honey. What is on your mind? I adore you more than words can express. Hank, you are the best husband a lady could ask for, and I'm glad for all of our good times together. We've been very intimate recently, and I want to make sure you're happy as I come closer to the finish. I've enjoyed every minute of it, Glenda. I couldn't ask for a better wife, and I'd like to continue making memories with you. Well, all of this intimacy has prompted me to consider new experiences. I keep thinking about new experiences I want to have before I die. You told me before we got married that you'd been with other people, which is fine. I was a virgin when we got married, and I'm glad I gave you that gift. But now I'm wondering if you would help me have an encounter with another man before it is too late. I'm not discussing an affair. Just one weekend and I'll be able to put it behind me. Would you be fine with that, Hank? I can't understand why, but I desperately need this. Hank was astonished. He didn't expect to hear this. Honey, I hope you're just going through a phase and this sensation will pass quickly. Or perhaps you're joking. Please tell me you aren't serious. I'm serious, Hank. I do not have time to play games. This is significant to me. This is all I can think of. I need this. Please let me know you understand and will offer me this gift, she pleaded. Hank's head was whirling. His wife wanted to be with another man and sought his approval. Glenda, I have loved you from the day we met. You are the best wife a man could ask for. I would do anything for you, but I don't think I can share you with another man. Before we proceed any further, who did you have in mind? 
Were you planning to meet someone new? Of course not. Do not be silly. I would never risk becoming ill. I've had a lot of thoughts about this, and I've spoken with Teresa and Bob. They understand. It would have to be somebody I know, love, and respect. Bob is the man I would only spend one weekend with. The need would be met, and everything would be in the past. Hank was stunned. His wife had secretly spoken to his best friends and persuaded Bob to spend the entire weekend with her. So you're going to be with my best friend, and he'll be with his wife. His wife is also intending to join me. Do you believe I'll be glad to be with her in return? You must be joking, he said fiercely. Nobody is cheating, honey. I am suggesting an exchange. It is not cheating if you are aware of the situation and agree to it. That's why I'm speaking with you now. Nothing has happened yet, I swear. I need this, Hank. If you love me, you will grant my dying wish. Hank was shocked. So you're saying you're not sure if I love you? And describing it as a dying wish is a low blow. You're not thinking clearly, dear. This is ridiculous talk. I can't go along with this. If you do this, it will mean the end of us, Glenda persisted. Hank, since we married, you've always given me everything I wanted. You've taken me on fantastic holidays, purchased me expensive automobiles, and let me buy all of my clothes and shoes, everything I could ever want. Why is this so different? Have I ever sent you on a trip alone with another man? No, it was always you and I. Did you purchase those clothing to wear for another man? No, you purchased those to please me. Glenda, it has always been just the two of us together. Maybe that's too much to ask right now, but it would wreck our marriage for me. Please think of it this way. After I'm gone, you'll most likely spend time with other women before deciding to marry again. I will never get the chance. Can't you see it? Is what I am asking fair? I'm sorry you had to make such a huge sacrifice to be with me and no one else all this time. Once you're free of me, you can test out as many men as you like. You won't have to worry about pregnancy or sexually transmitted diseases. You'll have it made, I replied sarcastically. Her ire began to rise. Look, I have always prioritized your and our children's needs over my own. I don't regret any of it. But now I think you should be a little more understanding and put your ego aside for this one time and let me have this, she explained. Glenda, if you weren't dying, would you want to have sex with another man? Be honest, I do not know. Maybe. Okay, thank you for being honest. I'm sorry I'm not enough for you. She winced but kept going. Let me ask you a question, Hank. If I never got cancer and asked you to be intimate with another man, would you deny me that? Of course not. After we divorced, you could do whatever you wanted with whomever you wanted, but you'd never get to know me again. She ignored my warning and proceeded. Didn't you always want me to have everything? You have always given me more than I asked for. Would you start denying me now that I'm making my dying request? Glenda, I used to believe that I was everything to you. Thank you for showing me I was wrong. She started crying and fled out of the room. Normally I'd try to console her, but this was different. I hope she changes her mind. I heard her talking on the phone with someone, but couldn't hear what was said. Ten minutes later, I heard a car coming into our driveway. Bob and Teresa didn't just decide to drop in for a visit. This is an ambush. As she went to the front door to greet them, I discreetly slipped out the back door and wandered through their neighborhood. I left my phone on the kitchen table so contacting me would be tricky. I had a lot to think about while I went. When I returned around 90 minutes later, their automobile was gone. I thought their attempt to ambush me had failed. Where have you been? I've been worried sick. Bob and Teresa stopped by and we didn't know where you were. Glenda explained that when you were unhappy earlier, I felt we both needed space, so I went for a walk. I do not recall Bob and Teresa stating they were coming by today. What's happening? She shot me a chilly glare. They were running errands and happened to be close, so they went by for a quick visit. We have both dropped in on each other dozens of times over the years. It's unfortunate you missed them. They wanted to speak with you regarding our prior conversation. I promise you that their excitement is one-sided. I have no desire to speak with either of them about the bomb you dropped on me earlier. However, they're our best pals. Who are your best friends? Who better to talk to about your concerns? They were my best buddies, but it ended today. They are suddenly your best buddies. I shall no longer have any involvement with them. Hank, you can't mean that. Why are you so stubborn about this? I only had a talk with you. There's nothing more. 
Are you willing to end a lifelong friendship without saying anything? You are a better man than that. I am sure you are, and so does Bob. I'm assuming you told them about our conversation while they were here. Of course I did. What are you expecting? They're our best pals. That is what friends do. They help one another. I suspected as much. And what counsel did Bob offer you regarding our problem? They understand the type of man you are. Hank, they all agree that you are the most kind, understanding husband, parent, and friend anyone could possibly have. He reminded me that you helped him find a job at the same place you work. He claimed he knows nothing better, Guy. I'm sure that wasn't all he said, Glenda. What more has he said about our problem? He stated that he sees both sides of the matter. Even though he's been your best friend for the majority of your life, you are not the one who is dying. He stated that special accommodations should be made for individuals who would shortly exit this world. His counsel made excellent sense. I agree with him. And darling wife, what was his advice? I asked cynically. She grimaced before speaking. He claimed it was simpler to obtain forgiveness than permission. You will receive neither from me. I seethed before going away. If Bob and Teresa weren't already history to me, they are now. The friendship is over. I will keep all interaction with Bob at work strictly professional. We work in various areas, therefore this shouldn't be a problem. Later that evening, Glenda gradually aroused me and used the opportunity to have her way with me once more. Glenda was satisfied with the amount of sex they were having, but Hank suspected she was keeping score. In reality, he didn't mind as long as she didn't cross a line that he didn't think she had yet. They'd been intimate every night that week, including Friday morning before work. Glenda informed Hank, Honey, I have something to say before you leave. Tonight around 9 p.m., I'm going to Bob and Teresa's house. Bob and I will leave from there. He said you won't talk to him about anything other than work, and you don't return his calls or texts anymore. Teresa claims you don't talk to her either. I'll be back Sunday afternoon, and I'm looking forward to seeing you then. I am telling you this, so you'll come right home from work tonight. I want to ensure that you are entirely satisfied before I depart. Okay. Hank's world seemed like it was crumbling. Everything was going to change. Glenda was going to do whatever she wanted. Glenda, you know I love you, but I can't forgive you for being with another man. And sure, I consider it cheating because I disagree with it. And I do not want you to do it. If you're with Bob or another man this weekend, I won't be here when you return. I will never speak to Bob or Teresa again and I will have nothing to do with our godchildren. You'll all betray me in the worst manner if you sleep with him. I will not touch you again, he whispered sadly. Glenda started crying. Bob and Teresa had assured her that Hank would forgive her, so she couldn't think he wouldn't be there for her, as she neared the conclusion. After tonight, my beloved spouse, you'll know who I love and need in my life. You. But I also need this. I apologize. You cannot regard my feelings and grant me my dying wish. She wanted to kiss him farewell, but he avoided her and swiftly departed. He heard her crying as he walked out the door, hoping she would reconsider. Hank returned home for lunch to check on Glenda. She had a suitcase packed and stashed beneath the bed, containing underwear he had never seen before. It appeared that her decision had been made, therefore he had to make his own before returning to work. He texted her. I need to work late tonight on a unique project. Sorry, I'm not sure when I will be home. Please alter your mind about joining him. He left his phone on the kitchen table. He would not be there for her that night. He wanted her to be concerned and possibly change her mind. Later, Bob discovered Hank at work. Hank, you should stop being so stubborn. Think of Glenda, not just yourself. This is her death desire. I can't say no to her. What I see is my so-called best buddy promising me that he will sleep with my wife to make her happy. I can't prevent you from damaging my marriage, but you should be aware that there will be consequences. If you touch Glenda, you, Teresa, and my godchildren will be permanently removed from my life. It will be the end of my marriage and our friendship. I suppose you will become Glenda's new boyfriend because I will not touch her once you have been with her. Hank, this is not like you. You are a better man than this. You do not mean any of it. I know you better than you do yourself. I do not care what you think. You know I meant every word. Now go out of my office. Do you want to tell the boss why you're wasting my time? Bob knew Hank was angry and would not listen to reason. 
He hoped that after Glenda and Hank had an intimate night, things would improve. Hank was incensed and shivering with wrath. Nothing they said could change his mind. Bob and Teresa seemed to care more about Glenda than him. Hank was normally easygoing, but there were some things he would not tolerate. He left work early to avoid Bob and headed to the gym where he rarely goes. He wanted to let out his rage and not be hurting the next day. He felt a mixture of despair, indignation, and helplessness while exercising. He grieved briefly but avoided sobbing in front of others. He left the gym at 730 after showering, feeling a little better but still with challenges to solve. He went to Harper's, a restaurant that he and Glenda frequented for special occasions. He reflected on all the excellent moments they'd spent there, feeling both joyful and sad as he evaluated his alternatives. He wondered if he was truly strong enough to stick to what he had told Glenda, where his beliefs were so important that he was willing to risk everything for them. We had 25 fantastic years before this happened. I never imagined I'd be facing this situation with her. I considered beating up Bob, but what good would it do? He understands how I feel and still intends to go ahead with it, even if I threaten him. Glenda had already admitted that she might have wanted this even if she didn't have cancer. When Hank did not return home that evening, Glenda became concerned. She noticed his cell phone on the kitchen table. She assumed he had left it there when he texted about working late. Hey, Bob, this is Glenda. I know it is you, silly. I would recognize your sweet voice anywhere. How is life at home with Hank? I hope things are peaceful, Bob asked. That's what I'm talking about. Do you understand why Hank would be working late tonight? He texted me at noon to say he'd be working on a special project. I can't imagine what Hank is talking about. I left work a little late and the parking lot was empty. Hank's car was already gone, even though we do not work in the same department. I am aware of any special projects or overtime work. Have you tried to call him? That is the problem, Bob. I did. As soon as I arrived home, I checked to see when he would return. But his cell phone is on the kitchen table, so I can't reach him unless he's at work. Didn't you say you were going to give him a very special lovemaking session tonight that would make him weak at the knees? Yes, I made it clear to him this morning, so the only conclusion I can make is that he is avoiding me. What will I do, Bob? Glenda, I know Hank. He's just having a little pity party. He's playing a childish game to mess up your plans. If he chooses to miss out on tonight, then he's a fool. He doesn't realize how lucky he is to have you. After you're gone, he'll regret missing every moment with you. Hank's a good man, my best friend, but even good men can make stupid mistakes. You know what you want? You deserve it and he's trying to ruin it. If you want to cancel, I'll understand. No, Bob, I'm not saying that. I've already put up with too much grief from him to cancel now. You're right, Bob. If he misses tonight, it's his loss. I'll save my energy for being with you this weekend. I can't thank you and Teresa enough. That's the spirit, Glenda. Hopefully Hank will come to his senses and spend some time with you. Thanks, Bob. I feel a lot better. I'll wait for him to come home, but I still plan on leaving around nine. I'll be at your place shortly after. Nothing would make me happier. Glenda, I promise to give you my best this weekend. I hope it's what you're looking for. I'm sure it will be. See you soon, Bob. Bye. As I sat in the restaurant, I thought about my options. If she goes with Bob, I will never touch her again. She would be breaking our wedding vows. She's not being forced. This is her choice. On top of that, I'm losing my two best friends. They're both part of Glentu's betrayal. I would never do to Bob what he's doing to me. The three of them will be dead to me. Divorce. I could have her served, but it would be futile as she would be dead before everything was finalized. I need to secure my finances. Who knows what she'll do next? I came home around 930 that night. She was gone. She had to be with Bob. I had never felt sadder or lonelier. The sorrow of loss was unbearable, but I knew what I needed to do. I found a sealed envelope on the kitchen table with my name on it. It was under Glenda's cell phone. She didn't want to be disturbed this weekend. I was fine with that. I opted not to handle the envelope and left it unopened. When I checked my phone for messages, I saw that she'd called and texted me earlier. She was concerned at my lack of response and said she'd make it up to me when she returned. She stated she needed this. She swore she loved me. And just me. Her comments didn't mean anything to me. I removed them all. The first thing I did was relocate all of my clothing and possessions from the master bedroom to the second bedroom. I made certain that no evidence of my presence in that room remained. 
Next, I took our wedding album and cut out all of my photographs from each one. I reassembled the album and placed it on her bed. I called my brother and asked to stay with his family for a few nights. He has a spare bedroom and encouraged me to stay for as long as I wanted. I took one of Glenda's sleeping tablets to help me fall asleep. Sometimes medication can produce miracles. The doorbell rang the next morning, waking Hank up. He pulled on his robe and walked to the door. What are you doing here, Teresa? I thought I made that plain to Bob yesterday. He said, Good morning, Hank. I could have used our key, you understand. Teresa responded, We both have spare keys to each other's homes. Can I come inside? He understood she was correct and let her in. What do you have to say? You can express it right here. Why are you here? So if you answered the phone, I wouldn't have to come over. She spoke for the last time. Teresa, why are you here? I am here for you, Hank. Glenda informed me you weren't pleased with the idea, so I'm here to help. You are one of my dearest buddies. Help me. Teresa, what are your plans for doing that? Hank, I can be a friend to chat to, a housekeeper, a cook, or even someone to spend time with to make you feel better. We all agreed that you could take me. This weekend they have each other. Clearly the three of you have agreed to many things that I disagree with. I have a lot to accomplish today, and you've arrived at a poor time. Please leave and do not come back. If you use that key, I will contact the police. Goodbye, Teresa, he said, closing the door. He stared from the window as she sobbed into the phone, probably talking with Bob or Glenda. He'd attempted to be nice, but he remained upset. She sat in her car for a few minutes before driving away. After breakfast, Hank headed to the store to purchase new locks for two of the doors. He felt better knowing he held the only keys. He then changed his phone number so Glenda couldn't reach him. Finally, he removed his wedding band and shattered it in his workshop, placing it on the kitchen table alongside her phone. He packed a tiny suitcase and went out to lunch with his brother's family on Sunday. Glenda was expected to return that afternoon, and he wanted to leave before she arrived. He had a great time with his family. When Glenda arrived home Sunday afternoon, she expected to find her spouse, whom she would comfort until he forgot about her absence. She was angry because he wasn't there. She thought he was conducting errands until she noticed their wedding album on the bed. She burst into tears when she noticed that he had cropped himself out of all the photos. Then she discovered that all of his clothes were gone. Has he moved out? She discovered the sealed letter she had left for him on the bed. She attempted to contact Hank, but the phone was no longer in service. Things were worsening. This was not what Bob had promised her. He had declared Hank couldn't survive without her. She checked the remainder of the home and noticed new locks on the spare bedroom door. Perhaps he had not departed, but was simply angry and stayed in another room. Not sure who to call. Glenda called Teresa to inquire whether Hank had told her anything about his plans. No, Glenda. When I called Bob that morning, I told him exactly what Hank had said, which wasn't much. Hank's cruel treatment of me hurt so much. What's happening? Glenda told her what she found when she returned home. Bob and Teresa listened over speakerphone. Didn't you leave Hank a letter indicating that you were going to quit your work and spend the rest of your time making him happy? Bob asked. Yes, Bob. I wrote him that letter just as you suggested. However, he never opened it. He doesn't know what it says. It is still here. She cried. Glenda, I'm confident you have nothing to worry about. It's evident Hank relocated his belongings to the spare bedroom to irritate you. He's simply having a pity party. He'll be back shortly. Trust me, I hope you're correct. Thank you for the encouragement, Glenda replied. Glenda then tried to contact Hank's brother and parents. His parents had no idea where he went, and his brother said he hadn't heard from him when Hank asked. Glenda understood it was her turn to be patient, just like Hank had been during the weekend, but she really missed him. She'd never felt more estranged from him, and she wept herself to sleep alone in bed for the first time in a long time. At 6.30 a.m. Monday, I contacted work before the office opened, leaving a voicemail from my employer stating that I needed to take personal days due to a family emergency. I didn't want to interact with Bob yet, and I didn't want any of them to contact me at work. I made the decision to move some money around to protect our finances. We had a nice nest fund after 25 years of marriage, and I wanted to keep it safe. I no longer trusted Glenda. I transferred two-thirds of our cash and investments to accounts that only I could access. 
She wouldn't notice unless she went looking, because all of the bills would still be paid. This took the majority of the day, but I was relieved to have a break from the drama. I knew the real confrontation would occur when I returned home. Tuesday morning, I went for a relaxing walk through the park before eating lunch at a nearby diner. The movie theaters opened at noon, and I spent the afternoon there. Tuesday night brought back some of the anxiety about confronting her. I promised myself not to argue. I thanked my brother and his family for giving me a place to stay and time to reflect. Wednesday morning, I returned to work. My boss did not inquire about my family situation, which I appreciated. When Bob found out I was at work, he went straight to my office. It's about time you showed up. Have you talked to Glenda yet? She's very worried about you. Bob said he shut my office door. I ignored him, went to the door, reopened it, and exited the office without acknowledging him. He followed me for a short distance, calling after me as I went to the men's restroom. I did not respond. I've decided not to communicate with Bob or Teresa anymore. I was confident Glenda would keep them informed, but I wouldn't speak to them. Bob would let Glenda know he had seen me. She made four calls in a row. I placed each call on hold and listened to music until she stopped calling as I left work. Bob said nothing but followed me into a restaurant. I did not want an emotional conversation to ruin my meal. He waited until I left, then followed me again. I noticed him on the phone as I approached my house. I knew he was speaking to Glenda. She'd be waiting for me as I pulled into the driveway. She rushed out to greet me, seeking for a hug. I hurriedly grabbed my exercise bag to keep a safe gap between us as we entered the house. Glenda tearful began. Where have you been, Hank? Do you know how worried I have been? I hadn't had a minute of calm until you walked in. Don't scare me like that again. I might have an idea of how concerned you were. Were you as concerned about my relationship with another woman as I was with yours with another man? I doubt it. After all, that would be cheating, correct? I hope Teresa told you that I didn't let her into the house. Her unhappy expression indicated that she comprehended my remark. I felt proud of myself for not raising my voice. Hank, I understand you're upset, which is why we need to talk it out and put it behind us. You don't realize how much I want you tonight. I intend to make it up to you. I just ate, Glenda. I am sure Bob filled you in. This is not a good time. I doubt there will ever be a good time. He wrecked your body for me. There's no way I can touch you right now. Even the concept makes me nauseous. I am exhausted. It has been a long day. Good night. Don't walk away from me, Hank. I was worried ill and you simply dismissed me. That is not going to work. I want you in my bed tonight and I'll spend the rest of my life making amends to you. Glenda, I just walked in and I'm tired. Allow me to shower and change. I promise we'll discuss later once I clean up. Okay, fair enough. I was stunned that I had no desire to be with her. She agreed with my proposal. I carried my stuff into my bedroom and locked the door. After stripping to my boxers, I changed into fresh clothing and took a lengthy hot shower in the hall bathroom. I knew this night would be difficult. To her credit, she left me alone. She undoubtedly noticed the lock on the hall bathroom door but did not try to open it. I dressed and returned my dirty clothing to my room, shutting the door again. I resolved to start washing my own clothing from now on. She was waiting for me in the den, sitting on the couch wearing a see-through negligee. I sat in a single chair next to the couch, which clearly angered her. Come over here, big boy, and sit with me. I have a lot to tell and show you, she remarked in her most seductive voice. I can hear you perfectly from here. What would you like to tell me? She explained that she was disappointed but determined. I love you, and I'm sure you love me. We're supposed to be together forever. I'll reach the opposite side before you, but I'll wait for you till you can join me. Until then, I wish you a long and happy life, even if it means being around other ladies. I do not want to spend any more time without you in my arms. Let us move forward from this topic and never bring it up again. I want to love you like never before, until I die. That is what I desire. Hank, I have a few questions before we go any farther. Of course, Hank. Go ahead. Have you had sex with Bob last weekend? She nodded quietly. Did you treat him the same way you treat me? Bob advised against disclosing any facts. He warned that it might make you too upset. I see. So he is in command of our marriage now. You've told me all I needed to know. Good night, Glenda. I stood up and left the room. Okay, okay. I will answer your inquiries. Please return to your seat, she pleaded. Before you departed for the weekend, I told you what the penalties were. 
Instead of believing me, you believe him. You entrusted the wrong man. You must now accept this as a reality. Stop calling him that. He is your best friend. He was your best friend before we met. They are our best buddies. You are just upset. Bob indicated you might need some time to settle down. He's correct about it. I figure I'll calm down in about six months. Her eyes expanded. Six months? I'll be gone before that, Hank. You cannot mean that. We must move past this now. Please allow me to assist you in getting over this. I will make it up to you. I apologize, Glenda. I am not in the mood to vomit. Intentional sickness is not on my plan. Are you leaving me, Hank? Are you saying it's the end for us? She inquired, her voice shaking. That was something I seriously considered. While you were with another man last weekend. As you know, I'm not the type of man to break his vows. I will continue to honor them till death do us part. I will not cheat on you as you did on me. I'll stay in the house, but we'll be in separate bedrooms. I'll pay the bills and complete my regular responsibilities. I am not going anywhere. I will not desert you. Remember when you were sick and healthy, but my vows do not obligate me to have sex or kiss you ever again. All I ask is that you stop inviting that man and his wife around here. If you do, please notify me so that I can leave till they are gone. What did I do? I've wrecked us. No, Hank. If what you're saying is true, it was not worth it. A thousand weekends with him or anyone else would not be worthwhile. My only hope is that you will forgive me before it is too late. I apologize, Hank. I apologize for what I did to us. The heart does not always listen to what the brain tells it to never do. Just one more thing, Glenda. Since you will no longer be having sex with me, if you ever get with him or anybody else, please do not do it in this house. Meet them someplace else. I do not want to know about it. Her face flushed with rage. Now you listen to me and you listen well. That was a one-time thing. This will never happen again. I want you to be the last man I am with. I pledge I will never be with another man but you. I heard you make the same pledge on our wedding day. You will forgive me for having difficulty believing you. She started sobbing uncontrollably. I went into my bedroom, locked the door, and left her crying on the couch. The next morning, I left early for work to avoid her. Bob stormed into my office at mid-morning. I won't leave Hank until you talk to me. What you are doing to Glenda is unforgivable. I will talk to you until you change your mind. I picked up the phone and called my supervisor. Hello, Dennis. I've got an issue. Bob is in my office and refuses to go. He is interfering with my work. Can you help? After a pause, I responded, Thank you, Dennis. Are you serious? You aren't man enough to speak to me, so you called in the boss? Something like that. I said as my office phone rang. Yes, sir. I will put him on. This is for you, I explained, handing Bob the phone. Hello? Yes, sir. I understand. This won't happen again. Defeated. He handed me the receiver. This is not over, Hank. We have too much history to let things end like this. I ignored him till he departed. He was aware that if he approached me outside of work, I would report any further harassment at work. I deal with it then. The doctor said Glenda had less than two months of good health remaining. I could put up with two months of hell if it was necessary. That evening, I went to a family restaurant to avoid eating with Glenda. I needed to discover places to eat once she left. When I arrived home, she had cooked dinner. Hello, honey. I fixed your favorite. I hope you're hungry. I noticed you were a little late, so I kept it warm for us. I'm sorry, but I had already eaten. That is why I am late. Since you won't be around for much longer, I'm looking for somewhere to eat once you leave. I should have told you. I'll eat out from now on. This should make things easier for you. You, asshole. You're also taking that away from me. You've made it apparent that I'm not available for sex but I was hoping you would allow me to prepare for you. Am I nothing to you now? Is this it? I can't say what you want to hear. Glenda, you apologize for being with another man. I apologize. There are consequences to your actions. Neither of us is pleased, but it is what it is. I'm heading to my room now. She started crying again. Hank, you do not have to hide in your room all the time. Can't you watch TV down here or something? I do not have the plague, and I cannot infect you with my cancer. Please do not shut me off totally. I froze. I will think about it, but only if you promise. Two things I mentioned. Tell me. She responded first. Never discuss that weekend or how much it cost us. I do not want to hear your side of the story. And the other. Never mention that jerk or his wife to me again. If you see them, 
Please do not inform me about it before or after deal. She looked unhappy because I was so harsh on our pals. Deal. She never requested to choose what to watch on television. We only discussed work, politics, family, and boring topics. She kept her promise on the difficult topics, but I knew they were there. If she contacted my old friends, she did it when I was around. She knew. It made me upset. So we had an uneasy peace. Every night I heard her cry herself to sleep. I do not believe she regretted what she did, only what occurred afterward. Then she surprised me. On Saturday, she requested to join me for breakfast and lunch. I wouldn't allow her to cook. I ended it by eating cereal and then mowing the lawn. I did the dishes after ordering a sandwich for lunch so I could continue working on the car. She was doing laundry and asked me to add my clothes to her pile. I said no, I would do them myself. She cried again before walking away. Who knew a woman would cry because her husband did his own laundry? I was relieved to have chores to keep me busy and distracted from my pain. Later I heard noise. Alan, Brenda, Elise, and Edward were chatting with their mother. I inquired as to why they were here. Alan said, Hi, Dad. It's good to see you, too, and hugged me. We've been talking to Mom since she became ill. She only has a few good days left, so we brought food for a cookout. You and Mom can relax. We'll handle everything. I enjoy seeing the kids, but this was no coincidence. I bet Glenda planned it. As they say, all is fair in love and battle. We weren't fighting a war, but it seemed close enough for her to employ the kids. An hour later, I was informed that the grill was clean and everything was ready. Glenda remarked to Hank, Honey, the kids want ice cream, but I need to get a few things. I will be returning soon and departed as soon as she did. My children made me feel attacked, Elise asked. Daddy, may we talk? Of course, I replied. She started. Daddy, Mom, and I converse a lot. We know what she did to Uncle Bob, she told me. We were startled, but we now understand. We understand why it was difficult for you, but you've had time to consider. She will not do it again. We believe her. This was simply something she wanted to do before her death. Cannot you forgive her? You have not touched her since. And you stopped speaking to Uncle Bob and Aunt Teresa. Dad, they have always been your best pals. Don't you see? Uncle Bob was simply assisting someone who was dying. You could have been with Aunt Teresa, but you were upset. Do you think I should just forget about it? I asked. All four of them nodded. I took a moment to collect my thoughts. I loved these folks above all else, and I didn't want to alienate them. Then an idea occurred to me. Alan, you are my son. You know I would die for you without hesitation, right? Sure, Dad. You have always been there for me. There is no doubt about that. Brenda is my son's wife. You know I adore you, don't you? I, too, would die for you if necessary. Dad, I said, of course, we adore you just as much. All four of us would do anything for you and your mother. That is why we are here, she responded, because we both love you so much. Brenda, I'm pleased to hear that. It makes it easy to ask the following inquiry. As you are aware, your mother's actions have not made me younger. I've thought a lot about bucket lists, including my own. So, Alan, would you be willing to allow Brenda spend a weekend with me to complete a bucket list item if she and I spent the weekend together as your mother and Bob did? It would demonstrate that you believe what you say and are willing to back it up with actions. If you do that, maybe I'll forgive your mother. Are you crazy? Alan shouted. Brenda flushed crimson red at the suggestion. I'd never agree to it, Dad. Not even if you were dying. I understand Brenda is not your related, but it still feels like incest to me. I can't believe you would even consider that. He was infuriated. You mean like Uncle Bob and your mother? That type of thing, I asked. They all became silent, reflecting on what I had spoken. I paused before speaking again. Brenda, I owe you and my kid an apology. I'd never do such a thing, not even if I were dying. I requested to make my point. Alan, you said you would not consent to it, even if I were dying. Neither would I. You have an easier time forgiving your mother because you are not married to her. But think about it, Alan. If Brenda left with me and returned, would you look at her the same way? Could you forgive her as readily as you want me to forgive your mother? As they pondered their options, the room fell silent. Alan nodded to Edward and they shook hands. Ellis embraced Brenda. Alan turned to face me. Dad, you are right. 
Thank you for teaching us another valuable life lesson. We just saw it from mom's point of view. We hadn't thought of it from your perspective, and you have opened our eyes. We still love mom and want her to be happy until the end. However, we recognize that she lost the right to ask for your forgiveness when she did what she did. We agree with your thoughts on Uncle Bob and Aunt Teresa. We aren't taking sides. We love you both, but we will not force you to forgive mom. She will have to accept that. We will support her in whatever way we can, but we won't let her use us to push you to forgive her. I am extremely proud of all four of you. I never wanted you to abandon your mother. She'll need you more than ever toward the end, and I know you will be there for her. I hugged each of them in turn, relieved with how things turned out. The remainder of the evening went nicely. Glenda was pleased with my good attitude when she returned from the store. The kids cooked the burgers and hot dogs to perfection, and the soft-serve strawberry ice cream for dessert was amazing. Glenda didn't get a chance to speak with them alone because I remained close after the cleanup. Hugs and kisses, Glenda wanted to talk with me. You appear to be in a nice mood, Hank. It's fantastic to see you smiling so much, she added. When the kids come to visit, it always makes me happy. How could I not grin around them? A little birdie informed me they were going to chat to you while I was in the store. They did not appear angry. So, did the conversation go well? Did they persuade you to see it my way? Your way? They claimed they treated both equally and were not taking sides. That appeared reasonable to me. You and I did an excellent job parenting those children, didn't we? My birdie had me thinking you'd either see things my way or be left out in the cold. I'm not sure about that, Glenda. Perhaps you might check with your bird again. I am going to take a shower and change. We've both had a really busy day. I left her perplexed as I went to the shower. I knew she had spoken to Elise while I was getting cleaned up. I wondered how her attitude would change following their conversation. You're just being stubborn and unable to get over yourself, Glenda shrieked when I walked in. Perhaps it is better that you learnt that now rather than wasting time with me. I said, I'm confident your friend will make an excellent husband as I clearly am not. She ignored me and added, Really? You asked Brenda to sleep with you. You should consult with her before making matters worse. I simply utilized it as a lesson. After hearing me out, they informed me that they would remain impartial. I'd never do anything with Brenda. If you do not believe me, ask her yourself. She was upset because using the kids did not work. I bet you told her what occurred. She was only trying to make me mad. I sat down and started watching television. She went into her room and closed the door. I hope she stays there. Another week passed with us rarely talking. She was becoming increasingly frustrated, but we managed to live calmly. We still did not eat together. I did my own clothes and dishes. She went out the next Saturday night and returned late. I assumed she saw those nasty folks, but she didn't say anything. And I didn't ask. I believe that made her even furious. Mr. Zikalala, the major boss, visited my office the next Monday. I rarely saw him. Good morning, sir. What brought you here? I asked gently. It's Hank, correct? Hank Greenley? Yes, sir. Hank, I have heard good things about you. Dennis, your boss, says you do excellent work. I'd like to know what's going on in the company, and I want you to know you are valuable. Thank you, sir. This means a lot. Yes, but there is something else. Of course, sir. Go ahead, Hank. Do you know Brian McFadden? Sir, I know someone named Brian McFadden. He's my wife's father, correct? He's my golf buddy. We have known each other for years. He never mentioned you worked here until recently. He wished you to succeed on your own, and you did. I respect that. But Brian claims you and his daughter are having problems. He also stated that she has cancer and doesn't have long to live. Is this true? Yes, sir. But he cut me off. As a father, Brian only wants his daughter to be happy in her final days. I am sure you understand. He asked me to check on you. Sometimes men should be nicer to their wives. It happens to everybody. I am sure you are a good husband. I don't want to hear from Brian that you aren't doing your part at home. Your job reviews. Consider your own character. You know, I was shocked. My father-in-law had turned on me. I could not blame him. But I dislike being under pressure. I didn't want to upset the CEO any further, as I said. Of course, sir. Thank you. I will handle it. Make sure you do. I do not want to have this conversation again. I promise, sir, you will not have to. Thank you for the advice. He left happy, believing he had solved his friend's problem. 
After he was gone, I wrote my resignation letter and packed my things. I went to HR, handed in my letter, gave back my ID, and left the building. This solved two problems. It kept me away from my ex-boyfriend and my father-in-law's meddling. But it created another. I was unemployed. I had a lot of time to think now. It was still early, so I went home and did some chores. Glenda came home from work at her usual time. You're home early. How come? She asked. I gave her my usual annoyed look. I quit my job today. You what? She yelled. Yeah, it seems your dad had it in for me, so I had no other choice, I said calmly. My dad. How on earth did my dad make you quit your job? Since you asked, I learned today that your dad regularly golfs with the CEO of my company, Graylin Zuccarello. Mr. Zuccarello came to my office this morning and told me your dad had been complaining about how I've been treating you. He made it clear that unless I fix things at home to your dad's satisfaction, my job could be in jeopardy. He threatened me with bad performance reviews that would affect my career. As you know, I don't take threats kindly. Even if I became your dream husband again, the damage is done. I've been cast in a bad light by the CEO, so I resigned my position, and here I am. How dare you blame my dad for you losing your job? You're a quitter, Hank. You quit on me, our marriage, and your job. Now you want to blame my dad for your failures? He's a better man than you'll ever be, she fumed. I see my mistake. I'm sorry for telling you the truth. I won't make that mistake again. How about this? My big toe hurt today, so I quit. Is that a better reason for you? You jerk. Why do you have to be so stubborn? Why can't you forgive me and let us get back to our normal, happy life before it's too late? Why would you want to be with a stubborn jerk like me? It makes no sense that a friend is a much better man than I'll ever be. Why don't you move in with them and enjoy the time you have left? He was the last one you had sex with. I bet he'd be happy to do it again. Why? Stay with me if I'm such a loser? Because I love you. And only you, Hank, no matter what. You're the only man I've ever truly loved. You're just too blind to see it, she said, frustrated. We were both stuck. She and her love for me and me and my refusal to accept her infidelity. We remained at a standstill. I'm going to get something to eat. I'll be back later. Why don't you call your dad while I'm gone and see if he can get someone to beat me up for you? I said sarcastically. I thought she was out of tears. I was wrong. I left the house alone to avoid more drama and have a peaceful meal out. Evidently, she did call her father while I was out, and she was waiting for me when I got back. I'm sorry, Hank. I had no idea my father would use his friendship with your boss to try to blackmail you. As much as I love my dad and appreciate what he was trying to do, messing with someone's career isn't right. His heart was in the right place. I take full responsibility because I hadn't told him the whole truth about my in-our problems. I figured as much. Look, I understand why your dad would try to use his influence to help you. You know, I'd do anything to help our kids. But I thought he was a better man than that. Now I see he didn't have all the facts. Well, I'm going to fix that if I can. And dad's going to help me unless he never wants to see me again. What do you mean, Glenda? How can you fix anything about my career? I've made a decision. Tomorrow morning, I'm resigning from my job. I won't need another job anyway. Dad and I are going to help you find a better job than the one you had. It's our fault. You were put in a tough position. So it's our job to make it right. Dad knows a lot of people besides your boss. He'll use his connections and so will I. We'll do our best to find the perfect job for you. Is okay? This is a surprise. I was expecting another argument, but this... This is unexpected. I don't know what my options are, but I'm happy to accept help from you both. Thank you. I twisted Dad's arm, and he's taking a vacation week to help us. I'm going to find you another job or die trying, she joked. True to her word, Brian was at our house early the next morning. He rode with Glenda to work as she resigned from her job. She had planned on resigning soon anyway, and was relieved to avoid the sorry you're dying going away party they would have held when they returned. Our house became job central that week. All three of us were constantly on the phone with business contacts and connections. Getting interviews was easy, but we wanted each interview to be a solid opportunity, not a long shot. The economy was shrinking and good jobs were scarce. I must have gone on a dozen interviews that week with their help. I'd never seen Glenda more dedicated. She had a fierce determination to honor her word. Help came from an unlikely source. Brian swallowed his pride and contacted Graylin, Zico de Lowe saying that he'd misunderstood his daughter's condition and had responded too soon. 
He claimed he was sorry for causing issues at Brian's company and explained that I couldn't go back my former position. Graylin was devastated to lose me and blamed his friend for overreacting. But then he swiftly claimed he'd make some calls to help me out. Just 45 minutes later, we got a startling call from Wellington Enterprises. They needed someone new to handle their purchases. They're a specific kind of factory that helps creators produce their product concepts. Real investors donate money for the concepts, and Wellington develops them into genuine goods. Making all sorts of diverse things is challenging, but they devised their own distinctive way of accomplishing it. We realize that most of the new goods don't become popular, but the handful that do make all the effort worth it. I talked them the next day, but it felt like they'd already chosen to hire me. They'd had problems with the last several people in that employment being dishonest, so they were seeking for someone honest and trustworthy. Greenland's nice word about me certainly helped. They offered me a lot more money than I used to make. Graceland was a genuinely nice person. I'd start three weeks after they resolved certain staff difficulties. I thanked Brian and Glenda for their assistance in gaining this wonderful opportunity. They both argued that was the least they could do given their involvement in my losing my previous job. Brian and I were back to being buddies. He appreciated that before the entire weekend event. I was a decent husband for his daughter. He further stated that in a comparable situation, most men would not have stayed with their spouses, leaving Glenda alone. Finally, as we shook hands, he broke down in tears, claiming he had regained his respect for me. Glenda seemed to have been waiting for me to gain this new job. The next day, she fainted in pain and turned bright yellow. I hurried her to the hospital where we were told that this was usual for her cancer. Her doctor sent her home with a variety of medications to relieve her discomfort and keep her comfortable. When people learned that they had paid her a visit, it appeared like they had said their goodbyes. I did my best to make everyone feel welcome and attempted to schedule the visits so that they didn't all arrive at once. Glenda informed me one afternoon that Bob, Teresa, and their children planned to pay her a visit. I responded that I understood and would make the necessary arrangements. She understood what that meant. I called Elise and asked her to accompany her mother throughout the visit and text me when they left. She took care of it. My daughter is incredibly intelligent. It worked out beautifully, and I avoided an unpleasant situation. That visit widened Elise's eyes. Our children began spending more time with Glenda, realizing she didn't have much time left. Two weeks later, I was too weak to get out of bed. Insurance. Let me hire a nurse during the daytime, and I looked after her at night after work. She was really thin and weak. She had a machine to aid with her pain. All she needed to do was press a button. She couldn't speak on the phone anymore, so I put it away. Everything went through me now. Teresa called to inquire about Glenda and was concerned that she could not contact her. I explained and she requested a return visit. I said it was not a good idea. She was sad, but she didn't express it. Our children and their wives took turns assisting me so that I could relax occasionally. That was a great assistance. As Glenda's condition worsened, I offered to put her in hospice, but she refused, stating that she preferred to die at home with her loved ones. I regrettably agreed. Glenda slipped into a deep sleep and could not be roused. I assumed it was a coma and realized the end was approaching. One of our children was always available, ready to notify the rest of us if anything changed. Late one night, I was in her room, ready to sleep. Glenda suddenly sat up. She had been almost unresponsive for two weeks and was suddenly sitting up. I'm not sure how she achieved it. She appeared bright and had the most lovely grin. Then she spoke. Hank, I'm sorry I hurt you. Please forgive me. I really love you. I rushed up to her, kissed her, and told her, Of course I forgive you. Glenda, I love you too. She softly laid back down and became asleep again. I knew this was it, so I called in all the kids. They stayed with me while I held her hand. Four hours later, she breathed her death. We all cried and hugged, clinging to our affection for one another. She expressed affection. I was fatigued from the arrangements. But Alan and Elise were extremely helpful. Glenda had made things easy by planning nearly everything ahead of time. She was cremated, and we had a memorial service in a nearby chapel. Elise anxiously told me that her mother had requested Bob to speak after the pastor. She felt it would be too much to ask of me. I was astonished that she had made these plans without informing me, but the kids implored me to follow her wishes. I accepted for their sake. 
Before the service began, the family gathered to console one another and welcome visitors. I wasn't surprised when Charlene, Joe, and Evelyn hugged me. They were our godchildren and had nothing to do with their parents' behavior. I hugged them back, remembering how much I still loved them. Bob and Teresa kept their distance but spoke with everyone else. Brian stood up better than expected. He made it apparent that he did not want any gap between us and I agreed. Brenda, Alan's wife, sat to my left and held my hand during the service. Elise was at my right, holding my other hand. I adored my children and valued the love Glenda had instilled in them for family. The clergyman delivered an amazing message of hope and deliverance. The music comprised three tracks that were similar to Glenda His Heart. Bob then took the stage. Brenda and Alice squeezed my hands, assuring me that they were here to help me get through this. Bob explained that Glenda had requested him to read a letter she had written. She must have given it to him during their last visit while Elise was present. The letter encouraged everyone to make the most of their time, forgive one another and maintain communication with me and the children. She even joked about assisting me in finding great women with whom I could live a fulfilling life. Everyone, including myself, chuckled at that. Bob finished just like Glenda, adding his own words. I've known Hank longer than anyone else. Glenda wanted us all to forgive one other. I admit I did something wrong, but for the right reasons. But Hank won't forgive me. We've been great friends since junior high, but he can't find the heart to forgive me this time. As Bob proceeded, Alan stood and signaled to the minister who turned off Bob's microphone. Brenda, Alice, Edward, and Alan assisted me exit the main chapel. Teresa, Charlene, Joe, and Evelyn all stood up and walked out with us. Bob was startled to see his own family depart. Alan explained, Charlene informed me she overheard her father perhaps calling you out. I planned with the minister to cut his microphone if he did. When he arrived, I spoke to him strongly, and he promised to only say what Mom wanted. I didn't anticipate his family to accompany us outside. I looked at Charlene. She stated, I love my dad and all of you. What he said wasn't correct. We understand what happened and stand behind you now. Your family, too. I apologize. We've been apart since that weekend. I love you all even more now. You've displayed your true colors, and what do I like? See? But you, Teresa, Hank, I apologize for my involvement in all of this. All I can do is express my sincere apologies and sympathies. My spouse did something wrong, and I do not accept his publicly assaulting you. I am humiliated. Please do not let his acts destroy your happiness. You've got a great family to support. You find joy in them. She urged Teresa, as a wise person once told me, you can be better or you can't be both. Teresa held me firmly. She was still married to Bob and had endorsed his and Glenda's activities. I was not sure if I would ever be able to overcome that. Moments thereafter, the doors opened and the audience began to leave the chapel. Everyone who passed away expressed their condolences. I requested the kids, especially Charlene, Joe, and Evelyn, to take care of the flowers from the service which they promised to do, and thanked them as I prepared to leave. Charlene asked if she may join me. Alan and Elise nodded in agreement as she took my hand and walked me to my car. She drove us home and prepared a delicious lunch using the numerous dishes that people had sent. She cleaned the kitchen and stayed with me until dinner. As my children approached, Charlene held me hard, said she loved me, and requested me to stay near. Charlene was a decent person who had been reared properly. Bob tried multiple times in the following weeks to reconcile with me, but I refused. His children invited me and my children to barbecues on several occasions, but they never mentioned Bob or Teresa's names. Following that, we didn't speak as much. Everyone has their own lives, and I was not saddened by it. I concentrated on my task, ensuring that we received what we needed on time and at a reasonable price. I led a team of seven people, three of whom were new. I was proud of how well we worked together. Everyone did their bit, and I considered them part of my work family. A little more than a year after Glenda's death, Alan sent me a weird SMS inviting me to meet him at a nice restaurant named Shea Roberto's on Saturday night. He explained that it was his treat and that he was working on something special and wanted me to meet his contact there. He asked me to dress in a suit. I wondered what he was up to and was pleased. He wanted to include me, I had my best suit cleaned for the meeting. Shea Roberto's is a posh establishment where significant individuals gather for special events. 
It is pricey, yet well known for its delicious food. I had never gone there before. Alan instructed me to provide my name to the person at the door when I arrived. He swiftly checked my reservation and instructed me to accompany the waiter to my table. As we went, I could feel the romantic mood, with couples gazing passionately at one another. There were a couple tables with businessmen, which I assumed was where I was going. As we drew closer, I noticed a nicely dressed woman sitting alone at a table. I felt she looked really elegant, and that some man was fortunate. I was astonished when the waiter asked me to sit at her table. There must be an error. I said no, and there was no mistake, he said. Could I help you with your chair? I pulled out the chair across from the woman and sat. She looked as surprised as I was. Hello, Teresa. Hank, what are you doing here? She asked. I am guessing the same reason as you. Let me guess. Did Alan invite you here tonight? No. Charlene did. I was supposed to meet her here at eight. Ah. And I was supposed to meet Alan here at eight. I believe something is fishy. Right. Then both of our phones vibrated with new messages. We both read them. Let me guess. Charlene can't make it tonight. How did you do it? I see. Yes, we were duped by our children. The waiter waited patiently, as if expecting something. Teresa, since we are here, would you like to order something rather than wasting the night? Might as well. She agreed. I've heard good things about this place. I agree. I spoke while looking at the waiter. Yes, sir. Could we get two menus? That will be unnecessary, sir. He replied, clapping his hands twice. Three waiters quickly emerged from the kitchen, carrying trays of delicious-smelling food. They placed the food in front of us as if they knew exactly what we wanted, then promptly left. We were both astonished again. How? When? But Teresa replied, These are all my favorite dishes. Mine, too. It's as if someone knows both of us extremely well. Isn't it ordered specifically for us? Those rascals! She exclaimed. If I'm going to be startled, I can think of worse things. You're correct about that. I responded, realizing what she meant. I can guess why they did that, she said. They knew you would never contact me. You made it plain how you felt about us after everything had happened, and now look back. I do not blame you, Hank. Actually, I don't mind too much because it's just you. But if he had been here with you, I would not have sat down, I clarified. He, do you mean Bob? Are you claiming you don't know? She asked. Surprised? No. Has anything happened to him? I haven't spoken to him since before Glenda died, and the children know better than to bring him up to me. I see. Okay, that explains it. A much has happened. Would you like to hear the story, Teresa? I don't have anything else scheduled tonight. You've made me inquisitive. Okay. But I must tell you that you will hear his name a lot in this chapter. It has been over a year. I think I can take that without being agitated. Go ahead, Teresa. Approximately three weeks after Glenda's memorial service. Bob sensed something was wrong. So he went to see the doctor, who sent him to a specialist. He was diagnosed with stage 4 prostate cancer. The only choice was to undergo extensive surgery to remove his prostate. The cancer had progressed to the point where they needed to eliminate all trace. During the surgery, several blood vessels and nerves were severed. Following his recovery, Bob found that the surgery had rendered him impotent. Due to the severed blood arteries, he was unable to achieve an erection. The injured nerves prevented him from experiencing arousal or orgasm. Bob couldn't ejaculate anymore. This news startled me. I had not heard any of this. The kids had kept me from hearing about his illness. She observed the surprise on my face and continued. I hope you don't mind my being honest, Hank. I've been close friends with both you and Glenda, so I feel safe discussing personal information with you. I nodded. Bob underwent regular radiation treatments following the surgery, which had a mental and emotional impact on him. At first, he worked hard to meet my demands in different ways. I believe it improved his self-esteem, but eventually his irritation took over and he stopped trying. He advised me to get toys so I could take care of myself. He felt sad and refused to seek counseling. He began drinking excessively and became verbally abusive. When he lost his job, things became worse. He began striking me. I refused to remain a victim. After three strikes, he was eliminated. My divorce from Bob was granted only last week. Hank, I haven't been intimate with a man in almost a year. My mind raced as I heard about what they had gone through. I'd never say it out loud, but I believed karma was a bitch. Then I looked at Teresa. I didn't know Teresa. I'm not sure what to say. I had no notion of his diagnosis or how he handled you. 
I feel foolish for turning my back on you, too. I wish I had been there for you. You did not deserve it any more than you already did. What happened, Hank? It appears like we both received a raw deal. I stretched across the table to place my hand on hers. We can't undo the past, but perhaps we can influence the future. I stood up, shifted my chair next to hers, leaned in and gave her a soft kiss. She was as receptive as I was immediately after our kiss. We heard a number of people get up and shout. Yes, they are pumping their arms in the air. We observed all of our children and their wives sitting at a large table in the corner watching us. We laughed till our sides ached and we could barely breathe. The sweetness of our children's gestures, the love Teresa and I shared, and the difficulties we had both suffered linked us in an unusual way. The dark clouds lifted and sunshine returned. We informed the kids that they still had to pay the check. Here's the next story. I waited almost a year after the divorce before calling Winslow Hubble. Things had calmed down, and the memories vanished, at least for him. For me, however, they were still fresh and sensitive. They remained powerful enough to carry me on while I planned and plotted the second half of my revenge. The first section concerned the divorce itself. It went relatively quickly. Ashley and I didn't have enough money to make it interesting for the lawyers. When the details of the separation were revealed, her parents were not interested in Ashley's attempts to tie me up in court— we didn't have much property to divide. We were renting and earning roughly the same, so everything went quite smoothly. Despite her best efforts, Ash did not want to break up, but I did. And it took her a bit to realize she was no longer in control of our relationship. I tried gently convincing her, but when that failed, I threatened to transmit footage of her infidelity to everyone in her address book. She folded like a high-speed origami craftsman. So, less than a year after Ashley initiated her illicit escapades in our marriage bed, we had separate apartments, bank accounts, and lives. We've always had diverse friends. We tried to get them together for a while, but her co-workers were from the Brooks Brothers Banking District, whilst mine were from the... I used to be a hungry writer, but now I'm a corporate salesman for Doc Martin's tribe. As we soon discovered, violent jackals and mischievous otters do not mix well. I considered punishing Ashley for her adultery, but ultimately concluded that divorce was adequate payback for a few nights of nasty entertainment. She had cheated herself out of a wonderful marriage, a nice apartment she couldn't afford on her own, and a promotion at work. She worked at Pierce Bateman, Potter, Gordon, and McDuck, an investing business that took pride in its steady married staff. Unfortunately, Ash no longer fits that criterion. She could still move up the career ladder, but it would take longer and be more difficult. Sometimes I wondered which loss had affected her hardest. Our Upper West Side sweet spot, our marriage, or her direct route to the corner office. In actuality, I believe I already knew. In the divorce, Ash received Winslow. I believe she would have liked him to depart with me, but she shattered that egg, and I didn't mind leaving her to face with the consequences. Winslow Hubble was my wife's lover. No, he was not. Lover is not the correct word. Whatever was going on between Winslow and Ashley was not about love or affection. He was not her boyfriend either. I hadn't kept up with my ex-wife since we split. Indeed, I had made every effort to remove myself from her life, but I was willing to wager my last money that she hadn't given him a second thought since I sent her the video of them together. Proceed to the next chapter. Before Winslow answered his phone, it rang twice. The double call was a high school tactic he used throughout college and at Pierce Bateman. Never appear impatient or desperate. Never pick up the phone on the first ring. If you knew this trick, he simply looked pathetic. The same may be said about Winslow. His voice is aristocratic. Arrogant. Winslow Hubble speaks. Hello, Winslow. This is Charlie Walker. Ah, Chuck Walker. That is a name from the past. I could hear the smile in his voice. The leather seat creaked as he leaned back. What do you want, Chuck? Do you have any money you'd like to invest? Winslow most likely knew. My little nest egg was smaller than the rounding error for the majority of Pierce Bateman's customers. Prick. No, Winnie, I'm all right now. I smiled, knowing that his moniker would make him wince. I believed it was high time we talked. Winslow snorted. Well, I can't think what we could discuss. Cook. Chuck, it's not like we're in the same circles anymore. He chuckled covertly. Alternatively, you appear to travel frequently. I can't imagine why I'd want to drink with you. Okay, Vinny, here's the deal. You still have a wife. I still have a video. 
I guess I should tell you a little about my ex-wife and myself. I'm Charles Chuck Walker, a former journalist who now gets money by editing fluff papers about Polly Lever, a very large and well-known corporation's charity efforts. It is not the most pleasurable work, but it is well compensated. The folks here are pleasant, and it allows me to have something better in retirement than cat food and a short-term heroin addiction. Ashley is an investment banker working on Wall Street. Unlike the tarnished idealism that gives a hypocritical twist to my job, Pierce Bateman is a fervent believer that money produces its own morality. Simply put, everything that is profitable is a good thing. Despite our various professions, Ash and I were an excellent match. We were both in our 30s, old enough to really consider having children, but still young enough to not take it too seriously. I was 5'6", brown-eyed and green-haired, and I kept in good shape by going to the gym three times a week and walking five to ten miles per day. Ash was 5'6", with dark brown hair, bright blue eyes, and a body that haunted my dreams both before and after we married. We met at a We Were Promised Jetpacks performance in Brooklyn when she spilled beer over my third favorite t-shirt, and I took her number. I spoke to her a lot that night. We skipped a Scottish reggae band performance and sipped beer in the small smoking area outside. I'd been in the New York dating scene long enough to know she was unique, gorgeous, and bright, with a light sense of humor and a straightforward, unapologetic tone that often took me off guard. I later discovered that she was the youngest of five children, with four older brothers who shared her directness and mischievous nature. We decided to go to the Muppets display at the Museum of the Moving Image the following weekend, and I discovered that the comedy and intelligence I'd observed at our initial meeting remained even after my beer goggles were removed. If anything, she was even more remarkable when I was sober enough to notice the subtle acrimony in her words. Six months later, she had my ring. A year later, we got married. That happened four years ago. Keeping a marriage alive in a huge city is difficult, and we both worked hard at it. I knew Ash occasionally stayed late at work, and she knew I had to rush to make a deadline or finish one of the articles I was writing on the side. We tried to plan subway rides and lunches together, but some days we just saw each other for a few minutes in the morning and an hour or two in the evening. Nonetheless, we tried not to miss a weekend, texted to stay in touch, and never ever overlooked a significant date or anniversary, even ridiculous ones like spilled beer day and the first proper date day. I discovered that Ash was a chameleon in museums. She was intelligent and knowledgeable without being condescending. While hiking in the Adirondacks, she was tough and competitive, oblivious to the bruises and abrasions she had, chasing me down the trail as we dated, lived together, married, and built a life. She discovered new aspects of herself, such as the enigmatic nature of her humor, her vulnerability, and her caring. It felt as if she'd given me those bits unexpectedly. At work, the chameleon let her predatory side emerge. Every Thursday night during Pierce Bateman's weekly sit-downs, I saw indications of her. The company has a permanent lease on a back room at the Three Olives, a small located in the financial area. With enough burgundy leather chairs, hunting, prints, and dull British cuisine to make even the most devoted Anglophile uncomfortable. While weekly attendance was not necessary, failing to show up, especially with a spouse, said that you did not care enough to advance your profession. So every Thursday night I made small conversation with Ashley's fellow financial works colleagues, soaked up news from her office and watched her work the crowd. Ashley's co-workers were mostly pompous former classmates, and many of their wives were lacquered blondes who had studied art or early childhood education in college and were looking for men with substantial earning potential. I attempted to blend in, but having chats about rooftop bars and Jimmy Choo Shoes makes you want to eat a bullet. Fortunately, Martha, a.k.a. Marty Hubble, came to my rescue. On the surface, Winslow Hubble looked superior. Half of them resembled one another. Pierce Bateman's wife is ravenous, bleached, and varnished. My assumptions about her came crashing down one evening. However, Abby Van Wert was discussing her husband's new love of curling, a Canadian game in which granite discs are pushed across an ice-covered surface. So let us get this straight, Martha muttered. Is she bragging that her blue-blooded New England spouse is spending a fortune to master a game popular among redneck Canadians? I looked over and noticed a sneer on her face. 
Martha, I realized, had fired her version of a vernacular, Hail Mary, a salvo intended to determine whether I was a fellow traveler or simply another one of those living in the pod, redneck base or Rockefellers. Inbreeding appears to be universal, I murmured back. Nonetheless, it is a deadly game. It is difficult to play polo with your eyes crossed all the time. We headed to the races. Marty, I discovered, was a Martha Stewart-like woman from her driven ambition to her dry Mojave sense of humor. Like the wonderful Mrs. Stewart. Martha Hubble and C.E. Petrosky grew up in a working-class Pittsburgh neighborhood, attended a well-regarded college, and eventually married a man whose Anglo-Saxon surname was little more prestigious than her Polish-Lithuanian one. She had a job at a well-known publishing house where she had already made a name for herself, but it was expected that she would quit and start putting out little hubbles at Pierce Bateman's endless happy hours. Marty and I would usually find each other in a corner, exchanging witty remarks and passing the time with a game of Nazi haircut. Bingo. Essentially, you scan the crowd of New Yorkers for the various haircuts of Goering, Heydrich, Goebbels, and Hitler in a place like Three Olives, teeming with testosterone and expensive hair care products. Let's just say it was a target-rich environment while Marty and I were silently bickering. Our spouses were working the crowds. They went their separate ways. Ashley, who was still paying off her student loans, spent the majority of her time sipping club sodas and using her wit and candor to hook up with guys wearing really nice suits. Meanwhile, Winslow, who likely spent most of his childhood birthdays at the Yacht Club or the 19th Hole, sipped gin and tonics and told smutty jokes to his former fraternity brothers. It was difficult not to notice the differences in class. Ash was attempting to integrate into the lifestyle Winslow took for granted while floating along, confident that if he failed there would always be another brother, another investment firm, and another cocktail party. And if rumors are to be believed, if he fails, he can always return to mom, dad, and a big paycheck, managing the family funds. Ash, those were our Thursdays spent swimming through the happy hour waters like a big whitefish. Then he began splashing around like a happy little seal. And Marty and I, drinking cocktails, watching shows, and devouring gossip like a couple of quiet anemones. It wasn't my favorite way to spend my free time, but Ash was happy and Marty was fun, so I didn't complain too much about having to put on a suit and cheer up my wife. Our marriage was a balancing act performed by two young people with a job that was too demanding and a bond that was too important to put down. It was a marriage of quiet admiration principles and compromise, the kind that young couples have when they come to terms and lay the groundwork for a lucrative career, a home, children, and the rest of the American dream. It was hard, but we worked at it, and it worked for us. That's not to say it was easy. Ashley had a tendency to be jealous, which I found outrageous considering how attractive she was. On the other hand, I had my own problems with the green-eyed monster in a city of eight million people, or the fear of missing out on a bigger and better deal was as much a part of life as subway rides and dirty water hot dogs. I found it hard to believe my wife had settled on me, and it was strange that she thought so highly of me. A much bigger problem was Ashley's sense of fairness in the office. Her morals were flexible, a necessary characteristic if you want to make your way on Wall Street. But in Ashley's personal life, her sense of right and wrong was rigid and unwavering when she felt she was being wronged. Ash was quick to seek revenge, and her revenge was, at least in my opinion, convoluted, secretive, and diabolical. It usually went like this. After Ash was convinced that she had been wronged, she would confront the offender and make her case often in elevated tones. A sincere apology or several apologies and some form of repentance could restore balance to the universe. But if the offender continued to claim innocence or was insufficiently remorseful, Ashley's inner vigilante came into play. On that surface, Ashley, let the arguments simmer down and life seemed to go on as normal. But in the background, she was hard at work, weighing the evidence, passing judgment, and calmly imposing the punishment she deemed appropriate. There was no appeals court, no stay of execution, no higher powers. When Ashley delivered her verdict, she needed no outside confirmation that she had done the right thing and she rejected any argument that she had gone too far. Sometimes I wondered where Ashley's sense of justice came from. I assumed it was a consequence of her childhood when a little girl sometimes found herself at the mercy of four enormous brothers. 
Direct confrontation was futile and complaining to her parents would have resulted in her being labeled a codger, a devastating insult in a house full of boys. I can easily imagine little Ashley coming up with worthy punishments for her brothers and then implementing them, and with four rowdy boys in the house who would suspect the angelic little sister. Ashley's early years as a partisan could also explain why her punishments often seemed excessive. By my reckoning, for every pound of crime, she usually imposed a pound and a half of punishment. Sometimes I wondered if she still saw herself as a powerless little sister, fighting secret battles with her older brothers. Or maybe that extra 50% was the court fees she charged as payback for the time she spent as judge, jury, and executioner. Case in point, one Sunday, a few months after we were married, Ash and I were cleaning up the mess in our apartment, sweeping out the trash that had accumulated in closets and corners, collecting clothes for goodwill and saying goodbye to college textbooks that we were finally ready to admit we'd never read again. By the time we were done, the living room was littered with bags and boxes, and I was hauling trash to the dumpster on the corner and to Goodwill a block away. All seemed well in Walker Country as we pondered the new space in our closets and bookshelves. Forty minutes later, I was lying on the couch clutching a beer in my hands, and Ashley was hovering over me, almost vibrating with rage. It seemed that the bag that was supposed to go to the dry cleaners had somehow gone missing after finding out that it wasn't in the trash and that Goodwill wasn't willing to let us wander around the warehouse looking for it. My wife was left in a complete state of frustration with no one to take it out on but me. Apparently, I hadn't looked over the bags closely enough when I carried them out of the apartment, and now Ash was missing three dresses. I apologized. What else was I supposed to do? but it was like trying to fight a forest fire with a handful of sand. After the third apology, I gulped down the rest of my beer, told my wife I needed to be alone, and went for a long walk. When I returned a few hours later, there were three new dresses in the closet, and Ash was asleep. The next morning, when I woke up, Ashley was gone. I did my morning chores and started getting dressed for work. The process stopped when I realized I had no pants. Not in my closet, not in the laundry room. Even my suit pants were missing. I texted Ash. Honey, have you seen my pants? I can't find them. The reply came back immediately. Check goodwill. Fighting a wave of rage. I finally found a pair of dark sweatpants in my gym bag. Not ideal, but I was running late, and they would last until lunch before I ran into Uniqlo. When I got home that night, I had three new pairs of pants as I put them away in my closet. Ashley watched me with a strangely satisfied expression in her eyes. Afterward, I went for another walk. Simply put, I couldn't spend another minute in the same apartment with her final tally. Three dresses lost due to honest confusion and twelve pairs of pants, including two irreplaceable pairs of suit pants sacrificed at the stake of divine justice. I don't know what scale Ashley used, but it seemed to me that the punishment far outweighed the crime. For the first time in our young marriage, I began to wonder if I had made a mistake. It took a few days before we regained our mutual understanding. Ashley never apologized, but my stony silence seemed to impress her. Over the next few nights, she brought home dinner, working her way through my favorite restaurants. On Wednesday, I discovered a J. Crew. That night, I had enough pants to last me a week— and when I went to happy hour at Pierce Bateman's on Thursday, she greeted me with a huge hug. It seemed like we were back. Besides teaching me to be very careful when checking trash bags before taking them to the curb, the pants episode taught me an important lesson about Ashley's revenge. While she seemed to derive a sense of satisfaction from being an instrument of divine retribution, her actions did not bring her joy. She treated revenge as a grim obligation rather than a hobby, something to be endured if only as a means of fixing the world. In the case of my ten pairs of missing pants, that responsibility was worth about $1.500, not counting my now incomplete suits. We weren't short of money, but replacing clothes crippled our finances for a month or two. Still, she accepted our plight stoically, as if the cost of our new closet was a tithe or a tax we had to pay to move on with our lives. Ashley never paid for the missing pants again, but every once in a while I'd see the odd, satisfied look flicker across her face. Usually at the moment I discovered something odd like salt in my cereal, or that the book I was reading had somehow disappeared. 
Eventually, I accepted it as part of our life together. I had my quirks, like my firm belief that peanut butter should be kept in the refrigerator, and Ashley had her quirks, like her psychotic need for violent revenge. But I reasoned, when you love someone, you accept them whole. I learned to apologize if possible, but I also didn't want to live in fear of my wife's temper. So there were times when I ducked my heels, battened down the hatches, and wait for hurricane force revenge to sweep through the apartment. We found a balance, and most of the time it suited us. Until Caitlin showed up, proceed to the next chapter. Let me start by saying that I didn't hire Caitlin. That decision was made by people three or four rungs higher up the food chain through a mysterious vetting method that I'm sure involves drawing a pentagram and slaughtering a goat. I was involved in one of a series of reviews at which I pointed out that her journalistic experience and ability to produce top-notch writing under tight deadlines put her in order of magnitude above the other applicants. The HR people listened to my group's reviews, thanked us for our time, and walked away. Needless to say, I was surprised when they took our advice and hired her. Neither Caitlin's impressive resume nor my non-participation in her hiring impressed Ashley when they met at a weekend run organized at work. The problem was that in addition to being a highly skilled writer-editor, Caitlin was also stunning. Ash and Caitlin were doing girl stuff, complimenting each other on their running clothes and sneakers and chatting about the weather. To an outsider, this might seem like a perfectly trivial exchange between a wife and her husband's co-worker, but I noticed a frown in Ashley's eyes. That didn't bode well for my marital harmony. When we returned to the apartment after lunch, Ash was uncharacteristically silent. I knew what was coming. She was silently marinating in her anger, festering and fermenting, ready to explode. Realizing that I needed to nip this in the bud, or I risked going pantsless again, I had just restocked my supplies to seven pairs and hoped they would last a while longer. I spoke up. I'm delighted you finally met Caitlin. You two seem to be hitting it off. I do, Charles. She's beautiful, my wife muttered. Where have you been hiding her? Charles. Not a good indication. Hit it, sweetheart. I smiled. We don't associate too much with my co-workers. In fact, I guess this was the first time you met half of them. Nonsense. I saw them all at the Christmas party. I kept the smile on my face. That happened eight months ago, Ash. Hell, half of the office has already relocated or moved on. Or, in Caitlin's case, hired on. She frowned. And what about her qualifications? B.A. Brown University offers courses in English, majoring in business, writing, five years of journalism, another three years of internet marketing. Basically the same as me. I grinned. Except Brown, of course. At this rate, she'll soon become my boss. Her tone had relaxed slightly, but her gait remained stiff, like an attack dog on high alert. So you'll be working for her? I looked back. There was still steel and ash. Eyes. But she smiled. Thank God, I thought. Of course not, my dear. I grinned back. You are the only woman I obey, and I would not call it work. Ash's grin grew even broader, and when we went back to our flat, we got right into it. The next few weeks went quite smoothly. Though it took a long time for the tension to subside, Ash never brought up Caitlin in conversation, and I attempted to do the same. I believe it is a normal textbook strategy for cheaters to never bring up the other woman. But in my case, I simply wanted to avoid upsetting the apple cart. I assumed it worked, and that I had miraculously avoided a bullet. Meanwhile, work continued as usual, at least until the end of October. Every year, my company issues a large report summarizing its projects around the world. Regardless of how long we labor or how many letters we write, the project managers and other philanthropic organizations, they inevitably wait until the last minute to send their reports. To complete everything, my team and I will need to work early mornings, late nights, and missed weekends for a week or two. We call it Hell Week. Figuratively, I understand. Did I mention we are writers? When Hell Week arrived, everything were almost back to normal, so ask me that Monday. My regular eight-hour workday evolved into a 12-hour editing marathon, and by the time I got home, I felt like I was held together by rubber bands and duct tape. I could only think about a nice shower and a cozy bed. I absolutely did not have the energy to fight Ashley. She pounced on me before I even removed my outerwear. Where the hell have you been? What? I halted and ripped off one sleeve. Didn't you receive my messages? You mean the message you sent six friggin' hours ago? I wondered. 
Had it really been six hours since I texted Ashley to tell her that I'd be late for work? Honestly, I couldn't recall. Despite my groggy state, I understood I had two choices. Engage in a quarrel with Ashley, which would most certainly result in my falling asleep on the couch, or attempt to defuse the situation, go to bed, and fall asleep. Has it been so long? I inquire uncertainly. I finished taking off my coat and looked through my wardrobe for a hanger. Sorry, I lost track of time. She taps her foot. This was not good. I am sure you did. I exhaled. Remember how I said it was a heck of a week, Ash? My staff was going to spend the entire day and more putting out an annual report. Tap, tap, tap. Remember how I begged you to stay in touch so I knew about dinner? Shit. Yeah, shit. I apologize, Ash. It was chaotic, and I couldn't keep checking my phone constantly. It's going to be like this all week. Tap, tap, tap. Was she there? Shit. The entire team was present all day, including Caitlin. I told Ashley that I looked her in the eyes with all the sincerity I could muster. My eyelids felt like they weighed pound forty apiece. Ash, I apologize for not stopping by to see you. I've spent the last twelve hours putting out flames, and really this will continue until we make our deadline next Thursday. That is eight days. Ten? Remember last year when I had to work the entire weekend? I'll need to do it again this year. I dropped my shoulders. I needed to go to bed. I'm very sorry, Ash, but it's part of my work. It was part of my job well before Caitlin was hired and it will become part of my work once she leaves. She is going. The tapping ceased. I chuckled dryly in time. You understand how it is? Team members are continually reassigned and leaving. The only reason they haven't moved me elsewhere is that they don't have anyone else to edit articles and manage the website. Ashley's brow furrowed again. However, for the time being, you will continue to work with her. Yes, my love. I am still working with Caitlin, Aaron, Kim, Jake, Brandon, and the rest of the team— and that is all I do. We reached a compromise. Ashley allowed herself to be reassured, and I agreed to respond to her messages promptly. She wanted immediate responses, but I persuaded her to give me ten minutes of freedom. It was a typical compromise, but neither of us were particularly pleased with it. I had to wear an electronic leash during the most difficult time of year, and she had to deal with her jealousy before we went to bed. She continued to look at me with a slightly hard stare. Our office apartment was filled with a fragile sense of peace. I felt like I was being pulled between Ashley's insecurities and the growing pile of editing. No matter how quickly my teammates and I worked. I knew from experience the previous year that we'd eventually reach a tipping point and the tide would begin to recede. But it was nearly a week away. Meanwhile, Ashley sent at least ten texts per day. A message would appear and I would have to take my attention away from my business to respond. Usually, I just had to put editing on hold for a minute, but a couple of times she texted in the middle of a meeting and I had to scribble a quick response under the table, hoping no one noticed. Her messages were always simple little notes like, How are you? Or hope? All is well. However, the meaning was clear. I was being watched. The timing also checked out. Ashley would sometimes text me a few minutes after I arrived at the office, and other times she would wait an hour or so. Sometimes they came right after each other, and sometimes hours passed in between. I had the impression she was playing battleship with me, hoping to catch me in an open moment while Caitlin and I were having a quick shag in a closet somewhere. It would have continued like that for the rest of Hell Week. But I made a mistake. My phone charger at home was on its last legs and only worked if I stuck the cord under the phone and pulled it tight. It was an easy fix. All I had to do was buy a new cord— but it happened during Hell Week and between Ashley and the annual report. I didn't have enough working brain cells to deal with another problem. As a result, when I got to the office Friday morning, my phone was at 7%. Normally, I would have plugged it in as soon as I sat down at my desk, but barely had I gotten my coat off before Jake came running in with the latest trouble, and I got right to work. By the time I came up for air, it was about 12. My cell phone was dead. In retrospect, the horror of realizing I'd been out of contact for hours should have been a wake-up call. But I'd been with Ashley for four years, and the frog was on its way to boiling over my pounding heart and growing sense of panic. When I plugged in my phone didn't even seem strange. Damn, 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 damn. The phone's battery was dead low, and it took almost a minute to get enough charge to start. 
My pulse was pounding in my ears. Damn, damn, damn. The phone emitted a quick vibrating beep, starting the download followed by several vibrating beeps heralding the arrival of a bunch of messages. Shit, shit, shit. The messages quickly changed from innocuous. Hey babe, what up? Too angry. Where the hell are you, Charles? And angry. You have five minutes to answer your goddamn phone. Shit. I quickly hit the dial the phone button, but got two rings and then her answering machine. She was checking my calls. I tried again and got the same result. The third time, I left a message explaining what happened. I then sent a message with the same, albeit abbreviated, explanation. No response. Another shorter message. No response. At this point, I was torn between running to her office to plead my case and going back to work. In one case, I would preserve marital harmony. In the other case, I would keep my job, which was very important, because after she kicked me out, I would definitely need a paycheck to pay the rent. Either way, I had to wait about half an hour for my phone to charge enough after the last batch of messages. There's no way I'm leaving my desk without my electronic umbilical cord. While I waited, I tried to get back to editing, but my brain was blocked and my heart was still pounding in my chest. I thought about the fact that no matter what I did, I couldn't guarantee that Ashley would back down. There was something wrong with this. I realized, despite my determination not to become hostage to my wife's temper and her strange sense of justice, this was exactly what had happened. Here I was in the middle of the hardest week of the entire work year, and I couldn't concentrate because I had missed a couple of messages and was worried that my wife might explode. There was something wrong with this photo. I was unsure how to communicate it to Ash. What can I say? How could I explain that I couldn't live in fear of her rage? or that her need for vengeance could destroy our marriage. I considered sending a text message, but quickly dismissed the idea. This was a discussion that needed to be had, face to face, possibly in a therapist's office. I was considering how to approach the subject when another communication arrived. It's okay, it's okay, all right. My God. Ashley had spent the last three messages attempting to make me feel horrible. It was obviously not okay. It's difficult to interpret the emotion from the words, but I assumed Ash had realized she was acting insane and let me off the hook, or that she had judged me guilty of some crime and was already plotting my punishment. And then something else hit me. Whatever Ashley's letter meant, there was nothing I could do about it. Going to her workplace was perilous, and attempting to talk her out of it by text was pointless. I knew that all I could do was wait out the storm and hope that when it passed, my marriage and closet would not suffer too badly. Proceed to the next chapter. I tried really hard to leave work early, but by the time I got home at 8.30 p.m., I was shattered standing in front of my apartment door as I had been every night that week. I took a long breath, collected myself, and stepped inside. I'm home, honey, I yelled out from the kitchen. The voice was normal, and I let myself be optimistic. Perhaps it wouldn't be as bad as I imagined. On the other hand, her cheerful tone raised some concerns. Why didn't she become more upset? Had she already started her revenge? Will my dinner be full of laxatives, ipecac, pills? After hanging up my coat and removing my shoes, I prepared to attack. But instead, Ashley greeted me with a relaxed smile. She chirped, welcome home, sweetie, and hugged me. What was happening? I was still in damage control mode. Hello, my love. I'm sorry I missed your messages today. My phone ran out of battery and she glared. Do not worry about it, sweetheart. You explained everything in your message, but she reached up to kiss me again. No buts. Mistakes happen. I picked up a new cord on my way home from work. Who was this woman and what had she done with my wife? In retrospect, I probably should have looked into it further, but it was nearly nine. I had just returned home from twelve hours of work, having narrowly avoided one heart attack. I did not want to incite another. I gave up with a sigh of relief. Thank you, Ash. I'll make sure my phone is charged tomorrow. She smiled broadly again. See to it, babe. Ash and I agreed that she would have dinner on Hell Week. She ordered Chinese takeout and I nibbled on it for a while, but the day had knocked me out and I didn't immediately find myself dozing over my plate. I should go to bed. I said, Are you coming? She bestowed a bright smile on me again. Maybe in a little while. I'm going to do some reading. Okay. 
I made it to the bathroom, performed my ablutions, and fell into bed as I dozed off. I noticed that there was a slight odor of something in the air fabrics, maybe before I could think about it. Sleep took me. The next day was Saturday, but I still had to go to the office. I got up, showered, and dressed quietly before leaving the bedroom. I looked over at Ashley, lying on the bed, curled up in a fetal position and wrapped up in the soft yellow sheets. She looked so peaceful. It was another of her chameleon faces, the soft, vulnerable woman I wanted to protect. She looked nothing at all like the tough financial analyst in the dark pantsuit or the confident wife I'd seen the night before with a satisfied look in her eyes. Wait. Satisfied? I felt my good mood. Deflate. Shit. I shake my head. No need to cause trouble where there wasn't any. I told myself that my pants weren't missing. My clothes were intact and there was no reason to borrow tomorrow's worries when I already had a hard day ahead of me. Still, I kept coming back to that look in her eyes. Had it really been there? Ash only texted me four messages that day and I tried to reply to them quickly. They were all fun and light, no yelling or swearing, and she seemed pleased with my responses. When I got home that night, everything seemed normal, mostly normal, and at the Greek restaurant she was served chicken with lemon. She often ordered takeout, but I wasn't going to fight about it. I searched Ashley's eyes for that. Satisfied glint? Maybe it was there. I wasn't sure. As tired as I was, I felt like I was imagining things in the bedroom. I smelled Febreze again. Honey, it smells weird in here. Did you spray something? Yes, I think one of the neighbors was smoking. The smell was really strong. Weird. A couple of the neighbors smoked weed, but we usually smelled it in the hallway, not the bedroom. I shrugged my shoulders. Mystery solved. Sunday morning went the same way. We woke up at six, showered and dressed in silence. I looked at Ashley, nestled on the pale green sheets, looking like some kind of mermaid or Botticelli's Venus, though dressed in a flannel nightgown. I kissed her and left for the office. Later it occurred to me the sheets were yellow on Saturday and green on Sunday. I shrugged. We changed the sheets pretty regularly, but we didn't stick to any particular schedule. I guess Ash just decided it was time to change the sheets. That night was the same food from the corner. Diner notes of a breeze and unbroken sleep. Maybe the smug look on her face. The next morning, a quiet shower, a silent goodbye, and a kiss from my wife, dead asleep and snuggled on the white sheets. I was at work that day. Shit. White sheets. I couldn't think of a single reason Ashley would change the sheets two days in a row. Or rather, not a single reason I wanted to consider. Add to that the Febreze and the maybe a satisfied look. And it looked like Ash was stepping up her revenge game if she was doing what I thought she was doing. It went far beyond disappearing pants all the way to causing irreparable damage to marital life. For a moment, I wondered if I really wanted to know the truth but realized this was a case where ignorance was not bliss. I couldn't live with my suspicions, and if they were true, I was sure I couldn't live with my wife. Before I had time to doubt myself, I did a little research and placed an order on Amazon. Dollar twenty-six later, including expedited shipping, a pair of spy cameras was already flying to me, and I prayed that my suspicions would turn out to be wrong. That night, Moroccan takeout Febreze and rose-colored sheets. The satisfied look was definitely there. I looked in the laundry basket, but it was empty. Shit, shit, shit. On Monday, the wave of editing ebbed and flowed, then receded. The queue of stories began to dwindle. The end was near. At 11, the post office received word that my package had arrived by noon. Work had slowed a bit, and my team barely looked when I said I had to run to a meeting. The cameras were disguised as a smoke detector, an alarm clock, and installing them in my bedroom was a breeze. Ash texted five times that day. At 515, I got a text that the cameras were activated. Apparently, my wife had gotten home early. An hour later, I received the last text from Ashley for the day. I wanted to know the truth. But if the video was what I thought it was, the process I hoped I would never have to go through was about to begin. I sat down to work and decided I wouldn't watch the video until the next day. If my marriage was over, the end could wait for another night. I texted Ash to let her know I would be home at 830. I wondered if she would be angry, but I couldn't bring myself to care that much. My emotions were muted, hazy as if I was feeling them through a fog. At eight, I stumbled my way home that night. 
takeout pizza for Breeze. A satisfied smile. Yellow sheets again. It made sense since we only had four sets of bedding. It also explained yesterday's trip to the laundromat as I curled up in bed that night. I realized that no matter what happened, I never want to smell Febreze again. The next morning, Ash was curled up in bed, glistening in the morning sunlight. I stared at her for a long time. I'm going to miss this. Between insomnia and fear, I was still in a deep fog. I embraced it when it dissipated. I realized an ocean of pain awaited me. Things have mostly settled down at work. It would probably be another two or three days before we were done. But we had already seen the light at the end of the tunnel. At eleven, I told the team I was going to a quiet corner, a conference room that the company had set up with couches, chairs, and a couple of small tables. It was essentially the corporate version of a student lounge. It was also the only place where I could watch videos from my bedroom in relative privacy. The only other person there was Kim, one of my co-workers. She was ensconced in a chair by the window, fully immersed in her laptop. I settled on the couch at the far end of the room. If the videos showed what I expected, I wanted to be with my back to the wall. My plan was to listen to the video, not watch it. I reasoned that seeing Ashley with another man would make it impossible to forgive her, and I didn't want to close off any possibilities before I knew what I was dealing with. So I put on my headphones, turned on the smoke detector video, and hid the screen. From the sounds of it, it was as bad as I suspected. The camera was motion activated, so it started recording when they entered the room. Somewhere in the middle, I recognized a voice. It was Winslow. God darn Hubble. I was crushed. Yes, but also bewildered. I looked up to the clock on the wall. I stared dumbly at the digits at the second hand, drifting across the dial. Only twenty minutes had elapsed since the video had began. My thoughts lingered on the number, repeated it. Twenty minutes, twenty minutes, twenty minutes, twenty minutes to end my marriage. Twenty minutes. I realized I couldn't go home that night or any night in the foreseeable future, given what I had seen. I would have to confront her. And given that she believed in my alleged infidelity and was thirsty for justice, there was no predicting how she would react. What is the proper approach to avenge a divorce? How would it look if you added another 50% to it? The only dilemma was when to warn her. The angel on one shoulder decided to write her immediately. He declared that the quality of mercy was unsuccessful, that forgiveness was amazing and I should inform her before she screwed Winslow again. The demon on my other shoulder said that just because I didn't want to punish her didn't mean she couldn't punish herself. At 520, my phone vibrated. At 630 p.m., I texted her, including video snippets. I told her I was staying with Aaron, one of my co-workers. Two days later, I started divorce proceedings. Next chapter, I had nothing but contempt for Winslow Hubble. From chats with Marty and the gossip I picked up during happy hours, I realized how his wealth and privilege had shielded him throughout the years. Simply put, Vinny's prep school pals, fraternity brothers, and dad's checkbook always got him out of trouble. I studied all of the traditional vengeance options and realized that openly attacking him would not work. His parents would ensure that the reverberations destroyed me and possibly Ash. Winslow, on the other hand, would most certainly remain a happy seal, ignorant to the devastation he was causing. The problem bothered me. How does one punish the man who has everything? As I laid in bed at night, I remembered Winslow's statements in the video about me being a suck-up and him being superior. He needed to know he was superior than me. No, no. And then I understood I had something to learn from Winslow Hubble. It would take time and much investigation, but what the hell? I wasn't spending nights at home with him anymore. I called him. Six months later, Winslow agreed to meet me at the Three Olives, where they had parties on Thursdays. I did everything I shouldn't have. I chose a place that Winslow was familiar with and knew would make him feel right at home. I arrived five minutes late to allow him time to find a seat and order his drink. I expected him to be dressed in one of the handmade suits created for him by his parents' tailor. So I went with a pair of comfortable pants, a blue jacket, and a white plaid shirt. He was shaved and manicured, so I let his hair a little tousled and didn't bother shaving off the five o'clock shadow. Winslow thought I was beneath him, and I intended to do all in my ability to confirm that perception. When I reached the table, Winslow was dressed just as I had envisioned, 
a tie with a pretentious Windsor knot pinstripe suit, a broad fabric shirt from Brooks Brothers and cufflinks. His gaze from beneath the hoodie swept over my casual attire, taking in every detail as he imagined himself in the host's chair at a bar. Four strong guys are seated across from the man he vanquished. He felt untouchable, just how I wanted him to. He didn't rise to meet me. Winslow? I said, removing my backpack and sitting down. Chucky smiled. It has been a while. Yeah, it has been a while. Give me a second. I beckoned to the waitress and handed her my order as Winslow gazed at me. Apparently, the lower classes should not disrespect their elders by ordering a gin and tonic. When she went, I returned my attention to him. Wendy, thank you for coming. He flushed at the nickname. I do not have much time, he snapped. And why am I here? To be honest, I had something to find out. He grinned and spun the martini glass in his palms. I believed the divorce would accomplish that. Yeah, it definitely ended things between me and Ash. I nodded to him. However, you and I have unfinished business, Winslow chuckled. I can't conceive what that would be. Your wife has chosen to test another man, he smirked. A better man? You simply couldn't resist. Why should I? Ashley is a gorgeous woman. His eyes sparkled, and she is so amazing in the bedroom. Besides, from what she claims, you weren't providing her what she required. We'll get back to it later. When I found out about the two of you, I considered taking revenge. Ashley's case was simple. We divorced, and I have not seen her since. We had a wonderful marriage, but she ruined everything. She'll have to live with that. I took a sip from my drink. You, on the other hand, proved more challenging. What exactly are you talking about? Here's the deal, Fluffy. You are protected. Assume they do the obvious and beat you to a pulp. His eyes widened, and he carefully took his hands off the table. I have no doubt that I could do it, and I'm sure it would be a lot of fun. But I'll barely have time to wash the blood off my hands before your parents lock me in. I averted my sight to my hands, which rested in his lap. Furthermore, you're probably the type of wimp whose parents force you to carry a panic button. In which case, I'll be lucky to land a few blows before the hired security guards slam me to the ground. Winston reddened and firmly placed his hands back on the table. He took a huge swallow from his glass. So you won't try to beat me up? No. Perhaps I can save up some money and hire a true professional to make you disappear. I tried not to smirk at the expression on his face. I needed to appear serious. But then I'll have the same difficulty. Your parents will almost certainly employ a team of investigators, and I'll have to worry about whatever evidence my hitman leaves behind. He'll get caught eventually. He'll jump me, and I'll wind up in jail. This time, I'm facing a murder charge and have a few thousand less to spend on my legal defense. Why not leave it there? I am sure I could. I interrupted him. I've been thinking about vengeance. I could send a video of you to your friends, parents, and co-workers. Winslow began to turn slightly green. But what's the point of that? Your parents already know what you're like. They have been cleaning up after you for years. Furthermore, once mom and dad find out about my attempts to tarnish your good name, I snorted. So, I guess my days at my current job are numbered. I believe my next job will involve the phrase, Would you like fries? Winslow leaned forwards. So you are going to leave it at that? Not exactly. I took a folder out of my backpack and placed it on the table. I realized I could do one thing, but first, here's something. Have you ever considered how much your parents shielded you? I don't think so. No, I do not think so. When I was plotting my revenge, I took some pictures from the folder and arranged them face down. I conducted a lot of research. It's amazing what you can discover when you have a lot of time and an endless supply of rage. For example, do you recall Mary Gray and Daniel Brennan? Winslow's face flushed with shock, but he tried to remain composed. I do not recall. I may have met them in college. I snorted. Do not be modest, Winnie. You did much more than just meet them. In fact, you are the reason they dropped out and returned home. I turned over the first picture. It showed a pale, black-haired woman holding a toddler in her arms. Maybe this will help you remember. Mary had the baby approximately six months after graduating from high school. He looks a lot like you. At least he did before he lost the baby fat. You will be pleased to learn that she graduated from a community college. According to what she posts on Facebook, the two of them are doing well. He snickered, but droplets of sweat formed on his forehead. 
You cannot prove that this baby is mine, he stammered out. Do not worry, Mary won't testify against you. On the other hand, young William didn't sign a non-disclosure agreement, and his DNA is ironclad proof of paternity. I raised an eyebrow at him. I wouldn't plan on going into politics. Winslow's face flushed and started to look a little stiff. So this is your revenge? He pouted. Speculation and innuendo. Sit tight, Winnie. We've only just begun. I flipped the other picture over. This one wasn't as cheerful. The woman in it had blonde hair, depressed cheeks, haunted eyes. It was harder with Danielle. In fact, I was only able to talk to her parents. It seems that after she graduated from high school, she became depressed. She almost killed herself. He turned pale. There's no way you hold me responsible for that. Well, you and a few of your fraternity brothers. Of course, there's no proof. Somehow disappeared. And she seems to have signed a non-disclosure agreement. But we both know what you did to her. He pushed away from the table as if afraid to touch the photos. Afraid they would burn him. You can't prove anything. Not in court? No. I stared at him until he looked away. But we both know what you did, Vinny. You know she hasn't dated anyone since you. She's afraid to go out like her mom says. She says she still wakes up screaming. Winslow jumped to his feet. Who knew he could move so fast? I don't have to listen to this, he hissed. I'm leaving. Not so fast. I said. I pulled one of the flash drives out of my pocket and tapped it on the table. Sit down, Vinny, I snapped back. Finish your drink. Order another one. We still have a lot to talk about. And you still have more to lose. Go ahead. Tell that to my boss. He laughed. He sounded high and hollow. Hell, give it to Marty. She won't leave me. Maybe. Maybe not. Maybe. Want to talk to Danielle? Of course. She doesn't have that name anymore. I stared at him hard. Your parents really put the fear god into her when he sank into a chair. You have ten minutes, he muttered. He loosened his tie and undid the top button. His collar was wet. Cut the crap. He, I've got as much time as I want because you've got as much to lose. So do I. I caught his gaze and he turned away again. Faster this time. Don't wave me off just yet, buddy. We're just getting started looking at the way he was breathing. Almost crying. I thought about Ash for a second. I wondered if she felt the same way as she began her retaliation. I could see how one could grow addicted to it. I took another breath. Moving on to the second part. Funny you should mention your employment, Whitney. You're correct. They wouldn't fire you for Mary and Danielle. Hell, they wouldn't even fire you for Ashley, even though it would be incredibly terrible on her. Unlike you, she needs a job. And unlike you, she's not untouchable. If your little afternoon delight came out, she'd be destroyed. And you, of course, would go free. I grinned. Hell, barring a bank heist, you'd probably be at Pierce Bateman's till they carried you out on a stretcher. What exactly are you talking about? He crossed his arms. I believe he was trying to appear stern. But from where I was standing, it appeared that he was trying to conceal his sensitive underbelly. It would not function. Winslow was all about the softer underbelly. You do not know. I stirred the gin and tonic. Don't you recall the Goldfarb account? How about it? You lost half a million dollars due to an error. An intern would have noticed. Did you ever wonder why you didn't get fired? Brave's face crumbled. It was not. It was not my fault. The secretary. I twisted my arm. Yes. Yes. The secretary accepted the blame. You'll be relieved to know she received a prize for it. Also, a wonderful reference. She presently works at Babbitt and Gallup. She appears to be thrilled about it. All right, Chucky, he continued. If you know so much, tell me why I wasn't fired. Did he actually not know? I focused on the face. Isn't this obvious, Vinny? Who always looks out for you? Who always saves your ass? Don, I saw a glimpse of understanding in you. That is it. You've got it. I watched another section of Winslow Hubble break away. No, they did not. Would you be surprised to find that your parents placed $30 million into their Pierce Bateman account just a week after the Goldfarb story? He gazed at me with impending terror. And this is in addition to the $150 million they already have. He stammered. No, they never have. I am. They pay your salary, Vinny, through brokerage commissions, transaction fees, profit-sharing fees, and a variety of other little payments. I'm willing to bet your parents pay Pierce Bateman a little extra just to have you around. I work on some of the firm's largest accounts. I laughed. 
He had no idea when. Come on, you shuffle papers on some of the firm's most important accounts, and I'm sure someone is keeping an eye on you to ensure you don't make any major mistakes. In fact, you are Pierce Bateman's highest paid intern. Hell, the majority of the secretaries there have riskier professions than you. I'm the goddamn president, he declared, his voice rising. Your wife reports to me. I talked softly, as if to a kid or an injured animal. You'll be vice president as long as your parents support Pierce Bateman. Hell, if they spend enough, you might even become senior vice president or CEO. But you'll never be more than a glorified paper pusher. I sipped. As for Ash, I'm ready to bet that her accountability to you is as simple as forwarding a handful of her emails to someone with real influence. He flashed me a quivering smirk. I had the power to seduce your wife, you bastard. Ah, uh, there it is. This is it. The arrogance I've been looking for. I glared at him. This seemed to agitate him. And now we get to the major point. Are you prepared, Winslow? Yes, you amused my wife in my bed. What was it? Four times, five times, six. And then I put down the hammer. How many times has it occurred since then? Winslow's face fell as he proceeded. It's been a year and a half of winning. How many times has my ex-girlfriend taken you back into her bed? It was following the divorce. She claimed she did not want to muddy the waters. You cannot be that foolish, Winnie. We've been divorced for one year. We had been living apart for a year and a half. I laughed at him. Moreover, the water was very clear. Mr. Plum, I have a film showing you two in my bedroom, in the conservatory with a candlestick. And after I moved out, you were able to entertain every night and twice on Saturday. The only reason you aren't together right now is that she doesn't want your fat flesh touching her. Screw you, jackass, he screamed. She enjoyed what I was doing to her. I was better than you. I slumped back in my chair. I noticed something funny while watching you two together. Winnie, you seem to mention me a lot. He blinked. What are you? What? Check out the video. It's astonishing how many of your talks center around me. What are you? He was breathing rapidly. I laughed. That's how it is. Q, correct. You said it several times in the video as well. Okay. Here's the thing. When most men meet a stunning lady, they can't stop chatting about her. But as soon as you get into a room with Ashley, you start talking about me. What? I was winning. I... What? I shake my head. Jesus, no surprise they had you work as an intern. Doesn't that seem strange to you, Winnie? It seems strange to me. He covered his ears with his hands. Stop calling me Winnie, you worthless bastard. He appeared as if he had run a marathon. He was panting and wheezing as if he was on the edge of tears. He curled into a ball, eyes closed, hands still covering his ears. I looked over at the waitress. She was speaking with a man in a suit. I figured it was the manager. I motioned to the check. I do not. Don't, he grumbled. I am not saying anything, Vinny. I'm only telling you what I witnessed, what you will see when you view this video. I looked at him. He was shocked. It's not a huge thing, Winnie. It's similar to like blondes or large women. Accept it and get on with your life. I will not, he whined. Winnie, I don't make judgments. At least not for this. I finished my drink and placed it on the floor. How about the rest of it? A child with no father? Lives were ruined. Broken marriages, fake jobs. Mommy and daddy provided the funding. Yeah, for that, I truly judge you. His fuss appeared swollen, red, and sweaty. His tie was a mess. His eyes were pleading. How about the video? You're... You're not going to give it to Marty, right? I burst out laughing. Winnie, Marty has had the video for a year. Gave her a copy as soon as the divorce was final. This one's yours. I handed him the flash drive across the table. What? But she has not said anything. Not one word. Wendy, I don't want to guess why Marty stayed with you or why she approached you in the first place. I have no idea what devil's bargain she made to get her ass out of Pittsburgh, and I am not going to judge her. I pulled a second flash drive from my pocket. As to why she stayed with you, perhaps it was loyalty and love. Or maybe it was because your prenuptial agreement says she gets half a million dollars if she stays married to you for five years. Your five-year wedding anniversary was, what, two weeks ago? Three, he replied absent-mindedly. Yeah, I'm not always good at remembering dates. Congratulations and best wishes for many more happy years. But before I go, this is for you. I handed him a second disc across that table. This is a video I made. We'll call it Chucky and Mrs. X. You can't see her face, and we've blurred out any distinguishing features, but I think you'll recognize her voice. 
I paused and picked up my backpack. Or maybe not. She does a lot of moaning and screaming. Thank you for listening to today's stories. If you enjoyed listening, please like and subscribe if you haven't already. Also, write a comment below with your thoughts on what transpired. Take care.